So Raj Vedam Ji has been, of course, you know, associated with uh, in the University of America, which is a, a, a premier institute in, in Texas, uh, working to bring along uh, I, uh, the Indian knowledge systems and trying to integrate that with the best of American learning. And he has been certainly very, very successful, you know, uh, in, in bringing about Indian knowledge system to the fore, uh, to American mindset and American people. And I'm sure he would be aware of the controversies that keep on propping up, popping up in America, like the textbook controversy and other controversies. And there is a, there, there are dedicated groups in America which always would like to denigrate uh, the Indian civilization and culture. So I'm sure he's, he's uh, been very active in that field and been uh, you know, struggling uh, to fight uh, such groups in America. And so we'll have a good time listening to him, his arguments. And uh, uh, so I now welcome uh, Dr. Raj Vedam uh, to deliver his, his uh, lecture today, Dr. Vedam. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Girish Jai. Thank you very much. Very, very nice welcome. I'd also like to thank Professor uh, Kapil Kapoorji as well as Dr. Pranav Kumar. It's a real privilege and honor to come and speak on the platform, Pratnyanam uh, JNU. So my talk very uh, provocatively asks, who are we as Indians? And the question obviously must go first to the narrative of the Indians themselves. Who, who do the Indians think they are? So according to the textual accounts, who are the Indians? Well, if you take a look at the Puranas, for example, the Bhagavad Purana, it's very clear. It says India was populated from the south. If you take a look at the Bhagavad Purana, it says that uh, we have uh, Vaivasvata Manu, who was a Dravida Desha, from, a saintly king of Dravida Desha. So it's from there, from the south, that uh, this king came and populated India. That's what the Puranic account says. And if one looks at how India was peopled, according to Purana genealogy, and I'm referring to Parjita's early works over here, Starting with the southern king, referred to in several Puranas, Bhagavata, Matsya Purana, and others, we have Vaivasat Manu. And through his progeny, Ishvaku from the Solar dynasty and Ila, daughter through the Lunar dynasty, we have the various uh, uh, peoples in India referred to in the Puranic accounts, Itihasas, and so on. And we have prominently the Ilas who have uh, spread all over various parts of India, according to the Puranic accounts. And uh, looking at, again, the geography of how the Ilas spread, according to Parjita at least, we see that the Ilas starting from here have gone to different geographical locations identified with Nasik, Varnasi, Kanuj, and the Drihus, the dynasties beyond the Northwest frontier, the Punjab dynasties, in the east, the Angas, Vangas, Kalingas, in the north, Hastinapura, Magadha to the east, and Mathura to the central, and uh, obviously identifying some more people with the southern parts of India, and so on. So very clearly, there is an account in the Puranas that has got a description of the Indian people themselves, who they are, and how they spread through India. So here is one account, if you were to look at the textual evidence. And it is intriguing that if you take the solar and lunar dynasties as proxies for the kind of calendrical systems they might have followed, we know India's got a lunisolar calendar. If we make the assumption, it is a leap at this point, but if you make an assumption that people who followed the solar calendar were in the solar dynasty, people who followed the lunar calendar were in the lunar dynasty, we have a remnant of that even today in India. If you take a look at various parts of India and see what kind of calendrical systems they follow, we see in the blue over here is the Purni Amanta calendar, and you have the Western Amanta in this, uh, in this orange color, Southern Amanta in this uh, uh, green color, and the solar calendar in the Eastern parts, the Southern parts. Very intriguing. I don't know if we can uh, make that call right away, but from the pranic account of peopling of India to the kind of calendrical systems we follow, there seems to be some kind of uh, uh, interesting uh, connection over there. Next, if one looks at the mention, the geographical area of India, as mentioned in the Puranas and Itihasas, if we take a look at uh, this map from Jijatravi, it shows that Almost all parts of India are represented in the Puranic and the Itihasic accounts, which clearly shows that the geography of India was well known in the uh, in the Puranas, Itihasas, and so on, not geographically restricted to some parts uh, of India alone. And we also have the textual account that talks about the dispersal. 
the battle of the ten kings, the Saragya. So the Rig Veda mentions about this, about how uh, Sudas and uh, ten other kings were in battle, and eventually Sudas wins and established the rule of Bharatas in uh, India. And this caused some to migrate out of India, and we can identify them with the Drahis who migrated out of India. It is intriguing to me that although so much of internal evidence is there on the peopling of India and the uh, outward migrations in a certain period of time, these are absent in the genetic signatures that have been reported from the West, and many other works. So we have some flags going up right there. Why aren't the internal accounts not being reflected in some of the narratives that are coming out there? Again, looking at the chronology of uh, Indians according to the Puranas, obviously we need an anchor date. If we anchor the uh, uh, events to 3102 BCE, then from then on, we have a, a identification of Purana chronology of the various kings, with some assumptions, obviously, how many generations there are between kings and how many years a king might have ruled. We can have a, some kind of a, a maybe a rational progression of thought over here that identifies certain key figures, for example, the uh, uh, Gautama Buddha in the 1800s BCE. The Maurya dynasty, very pr uh, prominently in uh, in this time, 1500s uh, BCE, as opposed to uh, Sandra Kutus, who was identified by linguistics uh, like uh, the William Jones and placed to 300 BCE, we have very, very uh, prominently in the Puranic chronology, it appears to be different. So uh, uh, these, these are what we can see as far as the Indian accounts are concerned, very, very quickly who the Indians are. What about the Western assertions? One's got to look at the contours of the problem here and take a look at what the Western people say. And we see that today, the colonial scholarship that started off the studies on India have become the received wisdom for academia and most uh, media and others. So what does this assertion say? This one, obviously, everybody knows about it over here. Aryan invasion, migration, bands of male warriors, Central Asia invaded or the story has become migrated now, migrated to India around 1500 BCE. They effectively replaced the existing civilization, according to this narrator, and brought an entirely new Vedic religion, Sanskrit language, Vedic ecosystem. So this is the story. And the methods that have been followed to make the story is one of linguistics. So we got to take a look at uh, linguistics in some detail. At any rate, there are some structural problems today in the narration of Indian history, and these cannot be ignored. Although there are people who try to shout this down, it cannot be ignored. There is an enforced narration in NCRT textbooks, in uh, uh, school textbooks, in media and other places, which talks about Aryan invasion. However, the evidence is showing something else. And I put question marks here because these, at, the, at this point in the lecture, these are prepositions. Towards the end, we'll try to see the validity of these things. Is it out of India? They tell that Indians, the identity is we are Aryans and Dravidians and tribals, and we can show these identities are manufactured. And several others, which we won't talk today, Indian thought only impacted the East, according to some, but we can show that Indian thought impacted the East and the West. They say Indian civilization is recent. After Harappa is destroyed, we don't know anything about them. The Aryans, illiterate people, nomads came into India. They didn't have a script. They had to wait till Magadha made contact with the Greeks. And then suddenly, out of the blue, they got Brahmi, they became civilized. So uh, Indian uh, civilization is recent, according to this narration, but we can show the Indian civilization is ancient. They say Indian thought borrowed from the Greeks and Babylonians. We can show that Indian thought seeded the Greeks and Babylonians, and, and, and so on. So the question is, how do we evaluate claims? We have two groups here historically talking past each other, and we have one group at least from this enforced narration trying to demonize the people who talk about uh, some other evidence-based narrations over here. So I am proposing that, obviously, uh, very logically, all of us uh, agree to this, that we need to have a methodology, examine the methodology, Look at the data, models, methods, and claims. So here are the kind of uh, assertions that we see. For example, what I call the out of India camp and the, uh, uh, the Aryan invasion theory camp. If we take a look at uh, the narrations that come from here, on this side, they say that Harappa archaeology does not show any sign of invasion. And this side, they say perhaps it is a migration, move the goalpost and say it's not an invasion, it's a migration. On this side, you say Harappa trade material is found in Mesopotamia, Central Asia, implying that trade is a thing that spread languages. On this side, you say no migration, horse, chariot that spread Indo European languages. On this side, you say you talk about horse, well, Rigvedic horses, 34 ribs, 
Central Asian horses, 36 ribs. On this side, say, Rig Vedic people did not know how to count, mistook this 34 for 36. Or on this side, they say, well, the Saraswati River is mentioned many Mandalas, and we know the geography and the climate, uh, the, the geology of this one. On this side, the assumption is that Saraswati River is mythical. So clearly, we have two sides that are talking past each other, and we need rational, logical frameworks to analyze this. And I'm saying there is a whole lot of data to analyze the claims. We have data from archaeology, from epigraphy, coins, literature, oral records, foreign travel, climate records, astronomy, sciences, scripts, grammar, language, religion, paleontology, climatology, geology, genetics. You just had to look for the data. There is so much of data out there. And these data can be marshaled into various models. And we have seen things like linguistic model, archaeology model, genetics model, astronomy model, and several other models. And I'm saying that we'll have to see several things. For example, when you have a worldview that you can capture some aspect of reality using your models, then the question is, what is the region of validity of your modeling mechanism? Obviously, you cannot model the universe, so you're capturing some small phenomena. In order to capture that small phenomena, you got some assumptions. What are those assumptions? We need to examine that. Next, if you present some data, you need to see the provenance of the data. Where did the data come from? Should it be filtered? Is there noise? And so on and so forth. Then take a look at the methodology itself. What is the methodology you followed? Are these some logical relationships, rational relationships, cooked out of uh, nowhere? Or are they mathematical relationships, semantic relationships? We need to look at the methodology. And then look at what your inferences and claims are. Will the claims follow from the methodology you followed? So we have to go very rationally and logically by looking at some of the claims. And you'll see startlingly, something different starts to jump out at us. So I like to go to look at the historiography itself. Who are the people who wrote the history of India? If we look at the internal accounts, we have the Puranas, Itihasas, Tala Puranas, and the oral records and the folk songs and other things are preserved in various parts of India. This has been our notion of history for a very, very long time. When the colonial people came, they wanted a certain narration of Indian history for the benefit of the civil servants. And so they wrote several accounts on Indian history, which were intended to solve their, uh, uh, serve their purposes. Things like showing that India's backward, primitive, stagnant society, it requires uh, Western Europe's uh, enlightened uh, approach to uh, help Indians, the white man's burden. And they were followed by the Eurocentric people after William Jones found the commonality of Sanskrit, Latin, Greek, who they wanted to know why do the Indians speak languages closely linked to the European languages to address that certain Eurocentric notions, ideas, studies, and uh, 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 assertions came about. Wherever the colonials went, the missionaries followed them. They were not far behind. And so the missionaries had their own ax to grind here to convert Indians. And so when they translated several of the Indian texts, including Puranas and others, a certain kind of translation took place. A certain lens was applied to look at all of Indian social dynamics, and uh, that took root over here. Since 1947, you'd imagine that, well, India is in charge of its own destiny. Unfortunately, the kind of uh, uh, narration that took hold was a socialist narration that uh, took hold from 47 onwards. So gradually, the Indic content was removed out. Even though the British were more sympathetic to the Indian accounts, the socialists were vehemently opposed. And so the Indic content went out with more and more toxic content. And since 1970s, at least, we have got a Marxist narrative in the history of India. What we have seen is all these agencies and frameworks have imposed their ideologies, taken the history, added their ideologies, and led to subversion of identity. That's why we ask today, who are the Indians? We cannot recognize ourselves in narratives coming out of here. We are seeing a distortion of Indian history and identity in these frameworks. We'll quickly take a look at that. So if you look at colonial missionary framework, you see religious, racial bigotry, and this has resulted in several Hindu phobic works. We know what William Jones, uh, uh, Max Muller, who, in whose works we see a desire to uphold biblical history in addition to several other notions. And we are seeing some uh, 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 attempts by them to distort the Purana chronology, especially William Jones with uh, synchrony of Chandragupta Maurya with Sandra Kutus, and that completely removes the uh, synchronism that Indian accounts had. Internal uh, uh, matching was there for the longest time. Purana chronology matching with Nepal King List, Kashmir King List, as Kota Venkatachalam has pointed out. But after William Jones, synchrony is gone. Even today, it's irreconcilable. If you take today's 
uh, enforce narrative of chronology of India and try to map it to Puranas, sorry, you can't do that because uh, it's lost because of this. So one has got a question, why? Why did these things happen? And we see that uh, when people ask, why would you even say these kind of assertions? Well, if you look at the writings, their thinking becomes more or less apparent. We see William Jones who asserted in this work, in Asiatic research, that the, either the first 11 chapters of Genesis are true or the whole fabric of a national religion is false. Why is that relevant? Because a Genesis account in that time, uh, uh, in the Anglican church, a bishop tried to say that by adding the genealogies of prophets in the Old Testament, he said, God created the world in 4004 BCE, God destroyed the world in Noah's flood in 3000 BCE, and nothing could have survived that flood event except the progeny of Noah, which is Japheth, Shem, and uh, Ham. So all the races, all these races they saw in, on, on earth were the progeny of Noah's uh, sons, basically. So by asserting this, he's trying to state that he cannot accept the deep chronology seen in the Puranas. Puranas have got a genealogy going back to great antiquity. And the question is, if God created the world 4004 BC, how can Indians have this deep chronology? So they took it on themselves to think that Indians are wrong, and they started correcting all of, uh, correcting all of these things. And William Jones uh, also said, I'm obliged to believe the sanctity of the vulnerable books of Genesis and other Asiatic research. Max Muller, I look upon creation as historical, and so on. India is presented as primitive, backward, stagnant society. British as modern, progressive, and advanced in their works. And we see a young chronology has been imposed in India with notions of Aryan invasion, discrediting of Indic sources. That's one way to deal with inconvenient data. When you have inconvenient data and evidence, you discredit it if you want your methods to uh, hold up. Of course, this is deeply unacademic, but that's exactly what is done by the colonial people. And uh, recent linguistic dates for Sanskrit works. Max Muller, letter to his wife, he observes the same thing. He says that uh, his translation of the Veda will to tell to a great extent fate of India and the growth of millions of souls in that country. It is the root of the religion. To show them what the truth is, is the only way of uprooting all that has sprung from it for the last 3,000 years. So in these writings, it's clear that the lens they came with and the prejudices they came with has impacted some of their works. They were followed by people like Risley, who were anthropologists at that time, using discredited craniometrics and other such uh, uh, discredited methods. He saw this many races in India, and the methodology he used was trying to see the width and the height of the nose to try and classify the ratio of that to classify different races. He was also census commissioner in India. He entrenched the notion of caste, importing the Portuguese casta. Uh, he took the fluid uh, Jati Varna system in India and he uh, enforced this caste. And uh, they, since then, we have seen so many problems in India because of some of these assertions. But this is what he saw. Going from the colonial perspective to Eurocentric, we see linguistics and a toxic etic academia in the mix. The etic is the outsider lens. Academia in India would assume has got the insider lens, but in several departments, we are seeing that is not the case. The outsider lens is applied. We talked about William Jones, but since William Jones, he was himself a linguist in some sense. He had found commonality of Sanskrit, Latin, and Greek. Since then, the Europeans have been in a quest to address who are they as a people? And initially, they thought there was a common language. That is why we have uh, uh, these, these uh, common uh, structures we find in various European languages in Sanskrit. And they thought India could be the homeland. However, in the late 1800s, they discovered the Mitannis and the Hittites who were in uh, southern Turkey, northern Iraq, in that area. And they appear to have what appeared to be uh, Sanskrit uh, usage over there, as well as um, um, uh, Several, several other other uh, issues that they, they they refer to Vedic deities in their peace treaties between the Hittites, the Egyptians, and so on. So they ask, how is it possible that there is a Vedic structure over here? And so the homeland shifted. Where could the homeland be? Linguistic analysis was born that time, and timelines are proposed. And Aryans had to be in India in 1500 BCE. Then around the late 1800s, early 1900s, they discovered the Harappa, Mohenjo-daro uh, ruins over there. And this whole thing became an Aryan invasion that uh, looking at the ruins, they said, here is evidence of Aryans having invaded this place. And uh, uh, the tools at that point were linguistics and archaeology. In 2000s, it has become a migration theory. Once the invasion theory has been discredited from PIE homeland using linguistics, architecture, and genetics. This is what we're seeing today. So we quickly get a flavor for linguistic uh, frameworks. 
The methodology is comparative linguistics. That's what people use in that time. They using a basket of uh, words from different uh, languages, uh, the Swadesh list and other such things. They try to look at the phonology, the how the sounds are made, the mouth, the back of the mouth, or against the top of the mouth, the lips, and so on. Try to see how the sound is constructed, the syntax, morphology, closely related languages, and try to. Uh, construct a proto language. The critique over here is it is subjective, informal, and lacks testability. It is also uh, lexical statistics are also used based on word list, identifying cognates. What is the distance between languages based on percentage of cognates? Again, the problem is a uh, language may have many words for the same uh, meaning, and uh, how do you identify suitable cognates is a problem. Glottochronology, which assumes that sounds will morph at a given rate of change. And the question obviously is, is it uniform for all time? If you impose a uniform rate of change, then does it account for invasion? All, 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 all the problems over there. Bottom line, several sound laws were created. For example, A greater than B means A is an older form of the sound, it changed to a recent form. Laws like Grimm's law, for example, for example, say Bha is uh, older than Bha, older than Pa, older than Fa. So th things of this nature were proposed and uh, they tried to find relationships between languages based on these kind of notions. And pretty soon we saw that an ancestral language, a hypothesized ancestral language is constructed, Proto-Indo-European, from whom daughter languages, Balto Slavic, Germanic, Celtic, Italic, Hellenic, Indo-Iranian, Indic, Sanskrit, Northern Indian languages. So this is the proposal that has come out of methods of linguistics like comparative linguistics and so on. We have to understand an idealization and whenever there is a, 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 any counterexample was found to one of the laws they had, it was patched up with a new law that will take care of that uh, counterexample. So this is not a systematic growth of a scientific discipline, but it's a kind of a haphazard growth. And when you see this kind of thing, the question is, are the methods that you followed, are they sound? Are the assumptions you have made, are they sound? Do the claims follow from the methodology that you had? Are there alternate meanings that can arise from the methodology that you have? And we are finding from Srikanth Telegiri's work, yes, that is true. Alternate meanings can happen based upon the homeland that you select for PIE at least and so on. And to give a flavor for this, one example is a wheel. There's a very familiar bullock cart that we see in India. This wheel is there in Mohenjadaro, Harappa, you see that even today. And uh, Vincha culture in Ukraine and other places, you see that. And uh, 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 people of God, the technology of the bullock cart will have words for that in their language, like for the wheel, yoke, nave, axle. In Sanskrit, the wheel is chakra, Latin is rotem, Greek is kuklos, yoke is yoga, lugan, zudo, and uh, nave is nabya, umbilicus, axa, axis. And here's a proposed reconstruction from PIE. The reconstruction says that whenever you see a star in the word, it means the reconstructed word. There's no such real word out there, academically reconstructed. I don't know how to pronounce this. I'll make an attempt, queklo, as some word like queklo, which became the proto-Indo-Iranian reconstructed word called kekro, which became the Sanskrit word chakra. So the irony of this whole thing is that the data to reconstruct the PIE was obtained from Sanskrit. Sanskrit provided most of the data for them to reconstruct this so-called ancestral language. And in a very strange, uh, curious sleight of hand, they twisted the whole thing around and the assumptions became the facts. So the reconstructed PIE became a fact. And from that fact, they derived these notions of uh, relationship between languages. Very, very strange methodology followed here. We're also seeing at that time, uh, Eurocentric German Arianism going into the mix because this came at a time when nationhood was a nebulous concept in Europe. Today's nation states of Europe cannot be projected back in time uh, at all because clearly they've had a very torturous uh, way to attain nation nationhood. And we are seeing in this word work by Brian uh, uh, Gija suggested that the Indo-Europeans are blonde that come from no idea. He just pulled it out of a hat. And these triads have become diluted and darkened in the places where there's a foreign admixture of uh, genes. And certain dubious interpretations of passages in Vedic texts are made to produce readings of fair invading Aryans clashing with snub nose indigenous dasas. And one more German, Theodore Porsche, he attempted to further the blonde cause and even simplistic logic, accepted without question, original Aryans spoke Indo-European and were blonde. 
So these kind of assumptions became received wisdom for the people who followed later, who don't question, where did the data come from? What is the provenance of the data? What did you see in linguistics to take that particular meaning? Those kind of things. In that time frame itself, Indians like Dutta were uh, opposing this, saying Germanism arose among the peculiar political conditions of uh, 19th century Germany. We cannot see why in India we should pin our anthropological faith in it. And he criticized the slave psychology of Indian mind at that time itself, who was accepting without question these uh, nonsensical notions from Europeans. Anyway, this language is reconstructed. And the next question is, if there is a PIE language, where were the people who spoke it? Because there is no archaeological evidence, there's no script, there's no nothing. So the search for the homeland, it is located in various places based upon the political nationalistic notions and so on, whether Northwest India or the Caspian Sea, Black Sea area or Germany and so on. Eventually, it was located in uh, Central Asia because it was equidistant between Europe as well as India. So statistically, they said that's probably where the homeland is. So today we are seeing there's a fusion of linguistics and archaeology in the quest of Western identity. For example, Kosina's defense of German homeland, it was based on linking movement of people with ceramic changes in archaeological record. And this person believed the spread of corded wear and linear wear archaeological subcultures was indicative of Aryan dispersal. And so uh, this person's assumptions are formative to later works. Maria Gimbutas again follows in the same kind of line of thinking, and we see uh, this happening. So today we have two modern narratives over here, Maria Gimbutas and Colin Renfro. These are the thought leaders over here. Uh, Maria Gimbutas comes with the Kurgan or the step hypothesis, where she says the Indo-European language expansion happened in three waves between 4000 BC to 1500 BC, with the domestication of the wild horse and the invention of uh, chariots and iron swords and all those kind of things. On the other hand, Colin Renfro, he says Anatolian hypothesis that Indo-European ex language expansion followed invention and spread of agriculture in southern Turkey, that area, 6500 BC. Some people today claim that genetics seems to favor Kurgan. These are uh, questionable assertions over here. And this Kurgan step hypothesis says 3,500 BCE between the uh, Caspian Sea, Black Sea, the Yamnaya people. At that same period of time, you had civilizations in Egypt, Sumeria, Harappa, Birana, Edekal, China, all these places. But this is a story of the European people. So it says that uh, these people had domesticated the wild horse, had the chariot, had iron, and so on. They set off on a conquering spree. By 2500 BC, they become the corded bear people this side, Andronovo people this side. By 1500 BC, they specialized into Hittites, Mycenaeans, Babylonians, Bactria, Margiana archaeological complex. And you find that here it enters into India in this time frame. This is the beginning of the Aryan invasion theory. And by 500 BC, they're entrenched in the Ganga plain. And you see the appearance of Dravidians over here by 500 BC. So these are the uh, fallouts of accepting a theory of this nature. So we are seeing that these frameworks have become enforced today. In the colonial hegemony, the Portuguese, Dutch, French, and the British, hand in hand with Christian imperialism, 1500s to present with people like Caldwell, Geo Pope, and others, and using uh, Eurocentric uh, academic methods, things like linguistics, anthropology, notion of caste, Max Muller, Herbert Risley, and so on, it, they all have convergent ideologies, like I pointed out in my framework slide. And this has led to Aryan invasion migration. And today, you might think this is a relic of the past. Unfortunately, that's not true. Their works has become received wisdom for the academy of today. And you have the outsider lens in the sociology. All of Indian social dynamics has been uh, uh, forced through lenses that are more appropriate for the European experience. So you're seeing uh, postmodernism, you're seeing subaltern, you're seeing many kind of notions that have been pushed into India today with uh, uh, very outsider jaundiced lenses over here. It works hand in hand archaeology, people like Gimbutas and uh, uh, Vila, Mar Marshall and others. Along with genetics today, people like David Reich, again, circular dependencies, they all impact the uh, Indian identity. And finally, the frameworks of socialists and Marxists, they destroy identity and history. And it's not surprising if you look at uh, Karl Marx, who argued that all of history is a history of class struggles. And uh, he believed that the working class will eventually triumph over the capital class, win control, forever erasing all classes and getting a utopian, classless society. He also believed that change will come on the back of a bloody revolution. That is what he believed in. If you look at socialists, 
In communism, a violent revolution is seen to get a pure classless state. In socialism, a less rigid, more flexible ideology. It seeks change and reform through democratic processes within the existing social political structure. But they are joined at the hip otherwise. They are both united in India in their thinking that all of Indian thought is primitive, backward, stagnant, and responsible for all the class differences. And uh, they amplify these voices and they believe it has to be destroyed. And that's why we see the narrations on Hinduism, on the culture of India, history, everything emanates from this kind of an ideology. You might think 1947, things have changed, but Nehruvian socialism came out of the country with Fabian so, uh, socialism. Nehru was a member of the Fabian society in the United Kingdom of that time that looked to establish a socialist state in Great Britain at that time. And that ideology has been impressed in India from 1947. And since 1969-71, his daughter Indira Gandhi made a pact with the communists who wanted the HRD in the education sectors, Nehru Hassan, and we see that the entire ecosystem of socialist Marxist education has been created and appointed. All these bodies and more have been created through uh, through, through the, these, these kind of methodologies. And in 50 years, they've completely eradicated the non-socialist, non-Marxist scholarship in India. It will be hard to go to any university and see, is there a professor here who's got an emic, an internal understanding of Indian history and is teaching that? It's not possible because you're a vice chancellor or whatever. The, there are some compulsions that require things of this nature. So these ethic frameworks have imposed a certain uh, 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 way of looking at India over here. Colonial people, they wanted to uphold biblical cr chronology. And they also wanted to show Hindus as primitive, backward, stagnant, Eurocentric, show Hindus as backward, stagnant, show superiority of white Europeans. Missionary to uphold the chronology, Bible chronology, show Hindus as backward, promote Christianity, and show that there are class conflicts. Showing that there are class conflicts, they could in induce anger in people and alienate them from the Vedic civilization and convert them. So that they did that. Socialist academia, we are seeing the same thing show Hindus as primitive, backward, stagnant, and history from below, the subaltern, amplify those voices, conflict dynamics, oppressor, oppressed, all these things, soften Islam's impact. We are seeing those kind of things. And Marxists, the same thing, show Hindus as primitive, backward, stagnant, history from below, show class conflicts. And we are seeing that, curiously, Dravidianism in the South is born out of a deracinated framework that adopts several of these uh, failed spurious notions into its own ideology. That is what we're seeing. And what is the impact of the spurious narrative? We are seeing that because of the narration that nomads of Central Asia destroyed a superior civilization, India had to wait 1,000 years of civilization to come back through Magadha. It says there is not enough time for knowledge generation in mathematics, astronomy, medicine, etc. So if you see any advanced knowledge in India, the question is, how could you have generated this? You don't have the gestation time for knowledge. It's only from 300 BC that you're civilized. How can you have mathematic astronomy? You must have taken it from the Greeks or the Babylonians or the Chinese. So this kind of a narration has come. And today we are told that Brahmi came from Aramiak in Levant. Mathematics sciences came from Greece. We say astro they say astronomy came from Babylon. The Turkic Muslims got culture, cuisine, architecture, music, civilization to India. Aryans got Sanskrit into India. The British got science, technology, and rational thought to India. And Bhakti came from St. Thomas and the, the Dravidians are Elamites. So there is a denial of agency in history today. This has led to a gross distortion of identity and growing divisive forces based on spurious ideologies. So this is a criminal distortion, like I'm saying, and we, it impacts every aspect of our chronology, Indian knowledge systems, and identity. So that is the background to my talk. I'm sorry, there's a very big uh, background, but I, we need an evidence-based uh, rebuttal. And I'll be trying to quickly uh, marshal some of these facts and rebut this uh, chronology. First of all, for shock value, I put a bunch of names over here, grabbed it from Wikipedia, all Indian thinkers, various uh, geographies in India, time periods. Not one of them is talking about Aryan invasion, that we came from outside India, that there was conflict in India, that we are North Indians and they are South Indians, that other such notions. Nowhere, whether it's Abhinava Gupta, Adi Shankara, Agathyar, anybody you take, any period of work, uh, you're seeing that they spoke as a common culture throughout India. This is the internal evidence. The internal evidence is curiously absent of any kind of conflict, outsider or any such thing. Going back to many thousands of years, 
there's, there's no memory, cultural memory of any such nonsense. If you look at Parjita, Parjita in a very early time frame asked the right questions over here. For example, he said, Indian tradition knows nothing about Aryan invasion. Northwest and Punjab were not regarded as ancient home, nor with veneration or special esteem. The esteem is in Varnasi and places like that, not in the Northwest. Tradition has preserved copious definitive accounts giving an entirely different description of the Islas and their beginnings in India. And uh, uh, Isla domination of India agrees with, of course, he believed in something called Aryans. So he used that racial notion here, Aryan occupation, geographically and linguistically, though uh, alter, uh, altogether accurately. And then he says, all this copious tradition was falsely fabricated. This truth has been absolutely lost. If the current theory, current theory meaning Aryan invasion is right, is this probable? If all this Indian tradition is false, why, how, and whose interest was it all fabricated? Indian tradition suggests a reverse origin for the Iranians, which is linguistically tenable. So very, very interesting. Parjita, after studying the Indic texts, uh, although uh, some of his assertions can be contested, he's trying, he's shown ask the logical questions. It is not a surprise because he was a judge. Because he's a judge, he looks at the evidence rationally, logically, and asks these questions. And we are finding in the work of Srikanth Telegiri a similar echo of those thoughts. Srikanth Telegiri has looked at, uh, 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 for example, he says that the Rig Veda chronology of the books, the Mandela's two, three, four, six, seven are older, and these are later. He's saying the earlier books show the geography to the east of Saraswati River, the later books show geography to the west of Saraswati River. So there appears to be an east to west understanding of the geography of India preserved the Rig Veda and not a west to east if Aryans are entered from the west, northwest. So very interesting. He also says that uh, all the linguistic work that has been done can become consistent only if the homeland is located northwest India. If it is not in Northwest India, we have a problem. That is his assertion. And uh, uh, like I said, his assertion is PIE homeland should be in Northwest India. Nicholas Kazanas, who looked at uh, uh, the deities, Indo-European deities and Indian deities and other things, and he made studies of these things, he said uh, that if there is a PIE language, it is so far back in time that there is no data to reconstruct it. That is his position. So he says, in his view, the mainstream academic publications on this uh, on the subject of reconstructing PIE are utterly worthless. Going forward, uh, uh, Harappa archaeology. Now, this positions uh, uh, how how the archaeology in Harappa became spurious in, in invasion. For example, Michel Danino he says in 2016 a paper that Marshall, who was working on Harappa. He did not envision any contact with Harappans and Aryans. He proposed Mohenjadaro had thrived from 3250 to 2750 BCE, ending a millennium before the latter's supposed arrival. However, Wheeler shifted the chronology forward in time to 1500 BCE, making the date conveniently possible for invading Aryans to have brought about the end of the cities, clearly identifying Poor's Rig Veda, reading accounts of uh, Aryans' violent conquests of Dasyus, and so on. So they read things into invasion that were not really there by fabricating some evidence over here. Michel Danino further says there was embellishment done. For example, Kosambi, the father of Marxist historiography in India, so he says that the end came soon after 1750 BCE. Actual termination of Harappa was abrupt. City was set on fire. Inhabitants are slaughtered. Evidence of violent end. Interpret as reality. Enemies spoken of as ruthlessly smashed in battle. Treasures looted. Cities burned down. Victory of barbarism over a far older, superior urban culture. So these are some of the things that he read into the data. Clearly, these are embellishments. And this was challenge. Michel Danino says that P.V. Kane himself uh, uh, in 53, he said extrapolating a man-made destruction of a huge city like Mohenjo-daro, finding skeletons is unjustified. Dales, another scholar pointing out the uh, skeletons in question belong to different epochs of the city. There is no destruction level covering the latest period of city, no sign of extensive burning, no bodies of warriors clad in armor, no weapons of war, not a sl slightest bit of evidence brought forth as unconditional proof of an armed conquest on the supposed scale of Aryan invasion. A bone specialist, Kenneth Kennedy, he says, the injuries on the bones of most of Mojadaro's skeletons had healed well before death. So many of these notions have been challenged. 
And uh, uh, Michel Danino has made some very strong assertions on uh, AIT scholars in this paper. He presents evidence in this paper that the AIT scholars have invented non-existent text, deliberate mistranslation of text, invention of non-existent archaeological evidence, distortion of archaeological evidence, methodological flaws like circular reasoning, recycling long discarded racial theories, misquoting, blanking, demonizing scholars opposed to the Aryan paradigm. Very strong words, but very, very relevant to the discourse. So quickly look at uh, other evidence. This is now rebutting only the, uh, the methodologies in linguistics, archaeology, and other such things. We look at other evidence that does not fit the AIT or EMT hypothesis itself. And one of the biggest ones is Saraswati. We are in an unfortunate situation today where we have to try to write papers saying, yes, there existed a Saraswati River because the AIT exponents have tried to say that uh, the river is mythical. So we see, for example, this paper 2019 on the existence of a perennial river in the Harappan heartland. You can see this is the Indus. Parallel to the Indus, this dotted line shows the course of the Saraswati River got through satellite imagery and other such things. In this paper, by studying the minerals in this uh, riverbed, they have tried to see that there is... Um, it stretches for 300 kilometers up to the Pakistan border over here. It's a powerful indication of, uh, sorry, indication of existence of powerful river in the past. This paper says that there were two distinct perennial phases. One phase when the river was continuously flowing 80,000 to 20,000 years ago. The second phase they detected 9,000 to 4,500 years ago. What is more interesting is dozens of settlements are found along the uh, river settlement over here and mentioned prominently in Rig Veda, obviously. So this is one very big aspect. And if you look at this paper from Dikshit in uh, 2013 that is talking about the archaeology by Deccan College, the uh, carbon dating and others, we are seeing settlements. You look at all these dots here by this dotted, li by this dotted line here, you're seeing settlements over here. Why on earth would ancient cities and villages be located where there's no river there? So there had to be a river at that point, and that's what we're seeing over here. And if you look at the uh, radiometric datings from then, this one is in uh, Mehgar. I just highlighted the uh, oldest one over here. This is 9,385 years before present or calibrated date, 7435 BC. It's the same. It's not available for this case. And the antiquity we are seeing here for these settlements is supported by both archaeoastronomy as well as genetics. Both of them are supporting this kind of an antiquity in these settlements here. Kalibangan, we are seeing the dates over here going to 6,700 years before present. And uh, if you look at Rakigadi, we're seeing 5,400 years before present or calibrated 6,180 years before present. And in Virana, we are seeing calibrated dates about uh, 7,570 years before present over here. So clearly, the carbon dating is showing settlements that are, are going to very, very ancient periods of time. Bibi Lal, another renowned archaeologist in India, so he has come out with a paper at some point in time where he points out the continuity, cultural continuity of the civilization, that there's no periodization. If one believes it's a Harappa period, followed by a Vedic period, these are spurious uh, periodizations that he says there's a common culture over here, whether it's the Pashupati seal or the swastika in Manjadaro or terracotta figurines showing the Sindur symbol over there, or terracotta figurines showing Namaste, Kalibangan, uh, Shiva, Shiva, this uh, linga over here, as well as uh, the yoga asana position seen over here, terracotta figurines. All these are showing a common culture from the, from the so-called Harappa to so-called Vedic period. And this paper that came out recently, uh, I think this is in 2000, uh, 2021, Journal of Archaeological Science, these people had found uh, seven multinutritional, uh, uh, what they call footballs from Indus archaeological site in near Rajasthan. And they are saying that the, uh, the remnants they found, legumes, cereals, moong, and other such things, seems to be a ritual offering. We know this today. Today in India, we offer to the ancestors Pindagana, and uh, we still offer uh, rice balls and such to, as offerings. And very, very curiously, this paper adds to the cultural continuity of uh, India. The notion that Aryans brought iron to India is a mainstay of the Aryan invasion uh, story. As you can see, Tiwari's work, Banerjee's work, Aryans brought Iron Age into India, 1500 BCE. We are seeing that iron has been discovered, for example, in the campus of University of Hyderabad in Gachibauli. 
uh, Professor K.P. Rao uh, led that uh, expedition finding uh, knives, blades tested in uh, in this lab in Hyderabad, optical simulated luminescence. They dated between 1800 to 2400 BCE in Hyderabad, southern India, for iron artifacts. Not surprising if one goes and looks at presence of iron in India by this Japanese professor, 2018, you're seeing that the oldest iron is in Gachibauli over here, 2200 BCE. We are seeing other ancient iron in various places that have been found. These are just excavated sites, in northern India as well as southern India. And you're seeing that this technology is migrating northwards. It is not coming from northwest into India and progressing south. It is progressing from the south going up north in a way, co uh, collaborating the Puranic accounts from its a no south to north kind of a move. We are seeing that uh, kind of a uh, thing in the iron records also. Then the Sanawli, it's the news these days. Everybody knows about the chariots in Sanawli in the near New Delhi that uh, several graves found with chariots. And the archaeologist on duty has said in this particular video that it is emphatically states, these are not bullock cart driven chariots. These are horse driven chariots and presented several evidences for that. I'm still awaiting a paper on this. There are some preliminary papers still trying to see that. This anyway invalidates that Aryans brought the horse and chariots to India. If we had these chariots as early as 2200 BC in India, that will invalidate that claim. Well, if we say that there's out of India, we need to try to make some, at least have some evidence for why would there be an out of India migration? India is a great place for equilibrium, right? It's a wonderful climate, a lot of food, very prosperous soil, a lot of waters, rivers. Why would people go out of India? Well, disasters. Disasters would lead people to migrate out. For example, we have got the 8.2 kilo year event, 300 year dry spell, 5.9 kilo year event, intense drought. A drought. And we are interested in the 4.2 kilo year event where there was 200 year severe flood. So this particular note in nature that says a monsoon hiatus 4,200 years ago that basically doomed the Indus Valley civilization. When that failed, people had migrated out. We also know earthquakes, epidemics, droughts, floods, these can cause migrations also. And here is a paper that uh, collaborates some of these uh, findings over here, looking at the isotope of oxygen. Now, oxygen, uh, uh, if you look at the uh, isotope uh, O18 concentration in various places, that gives an indication of a dry spell or a wet spell. So this particular paper in 2017 looked at several artifacts uh, using the isotope from North India to reconstruct the monsoon variability on socially relevant timescales, allowing to examine the history of the civilization changes in the context of varying hydroclimatic conditions of the past 5,700 years. They got some samples from the caves here, Sahia, as well as over here, and they made these studies. And they presented this graph to show the concentration of this uh, uh, delta oxygen 18 as a percentage over here. And these show uh, warm spells and these show uh, uh, dry uh, wet spells. And you can see it on this 4,200 BC or so on, the 2000 BC event, there's an elevated measurement of this. So one more paper that is correlating with the monsoon failure. That's what we are. There are several papers. I just put took one paper over here. If you look at uh, this paper in uh, PLOS that is talking in 2013 paper, empty DNA from the early Bronze Age to the Roman period suggests a genetic link between Indian subcontinent and Mesopotamian cradle of civilization. So this one says, uh, by examining the remains of some skeletons in uh, Syria, they found the genetic link with India and going back to a, uh, between this time frame, 2500 to 500 BC. Once again, uh, indicator for an out of India migration. An interesting paper in science that came out some time back, this I think is 2016. This, they found a, a ice man in the Alps, the Swiss Alps, a well preserved body, and they have studied him in great deal, they're called Aussie, the ice man. And they've studied even the stomach contents what was his last meal, what did he uh, eat, and such things. And in his stomach, they found the H. pylori bacterium, the Heliobacter bacterium. Even bacteria has got a genetic lineage. By trying to identify the lineage of the bacteria, they found a link with uh, northern India. So either this man was in cultural proximity with India or he had eaten some very Indian-based meal, surprisingly in the Alps that time, but his stomach seemed to contain the pathogens that are associated with northern India. One more on cattle genomics. This paper came in Science in 2019, and this one is talking about the family humped bull. 
that the Zebu from Indus Valley is in Anatolia. This one says that a later Bronze Age shift indicates a rapid, widespread integration of Zebu Bos Indicus from the Indus Valley, stimulated by the onset of the current geological age 4.2 thousand years ago by a widespread multi-century drought. It turns out that the Indian Zebu cattle are arid adapted and they uh, enhance a herd survival. And suddenly you see the appearance of this in uh, in Hittite lands, in Mitanni lands, which is northern uh, uh, Iraq, southern Turkey, and such places. And the question is, do Indian cattle by themselves make the migration or who takes them over there? So the people have migrated with their biggest possessions. Possessions are the cattle, and they've landed up over here. This Acadian seal, the Lower Museum in Paris, that shows even today uh, the Indian long horn bull over there. This paper came out in 2019 by this Russian scholar, and he has attempted to link the Zebu that is there in East Mediterranean, including Syria, Anatolia, Palestine, correlating with the present geographical distribution of the human Y haplogroup. All these haplogroups originating from Hindustan and of South Asian human genome uh, in this place. So he's made the connection. Not only is there cattle over there, it also correlates the genetic signal that is present in India that is uh, seen over here. All of these things are adding up towards an out of India migration this time frame. A couple of other invalidators, the claim that agriculture was invented in Turkey 7000 BCE and spread to India, implying a northwest to east migration, that is invalidated dated by this work from Lucknow in uh, 2018 that is showing that paddy was cultivated uh, in the Holocene era itself, evidence in Lahuradeva lake sediments and Ganga plain. So this one is showing that maybe 9,000 years ago, uh, paddy was already being cultivated in the Ganga plain. Very, very interesting. Also the genomics of the mice. If you take a look at uh, 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 this particular paper that came out in 2007, so this is uh, alerted by Dr. Premendra Priyadarshi. The genomics of the mouse shows that the ancestor of the mice lived in India. It is from India that the mice uh, migrated to Madagascar, Africa, uh, Europe, Central Asia, and all of these places, Southeast Asia and such places. And we know that mice follows human activity, whether it's agriculture, storage, or humans are migrating out, they are also following that. So one more indicator showing an out-of-India migration over here. So. Having said that, I'd like to very quickly talk about the antiquity of the Indian people. So I have given a couple of talks in Sangam. There's a, a Indian civilization untold story and revisiting Indian civilization, where I've presented a great many number of facts uh, deriving from archaeology, paleontology, and others. The summary of that one is that in southern India, you have one million year old uh, samples that could probably have come from the Homo erectus. In Narmada man's skull, that is from Narmada Valley, this is dated to 350,000 years ago by Kenneth Kennedy. Athiram Pakam, Shanti Papu, and uh, fellow researchers have uh, uncovered stone tools going back to 350,000 years ago, probably made by an early species of Homo sapiens over there. Then 40,000 years ago, we've seen cave art all over India. We find tools uh, and such things. Ports and settlements, there was a paper that came out uh, in 2019 or 20 that is Professor Ramaswamy from Bharti Dasan University that's talking about how submerged human uh, uh, activities are found in, in the Bay of Bengal, Pumpuhar, dating back to the last glacial maximum, which is around 18,000 years ago. Very, very intriguing works. And we are finding 10,000-year-old artifacts, Hedakal in Kerala, Birana, 8,000-year-old artifacts from Dwaraka, underwater artifacts, and so-called recent artifacts from 5,000 years, Harappa, Saraswati, Ganga, Plain, Kiradi, Arikimedu, Patanam, and so on. So we have a continuous record, archaeological record, that is showing evidence of human presence in India for a very, very long time. That is the bottom line. If we take a look at the genetics information itself, let me just close this over here. If you take a look at the empty DNA haplogroups, uh, over here, what we attempt to do is by looking at the differences in the genome from different peoples, we try to infer a record of migrations. That is the attempt over here. And people construct what are called phylogenetic trees. And they can be done, earlier studies are done with the gender chromosomes, the empty DNA for the female chromosomes or the Y chromosome for the male. And so this early work says, 
L0 to L6, these are labels for certain haplogroups, and these are all in Africa. Earliest ones are in Africa. Out of Africa, the first two we see are the M and the N, and this M and N are in India. It is from M and N that all the non-African population of the world has been derived from. That is what we see from this record here. Going forward to put it on a map, you see L0 to L6 are all in Africa. Then this group out of Africa, M, N, and R, and then you're seeing the R getting out into Europe and other places, to Central Asia, to Australia, and this line goes all the way to North and South America too. Orange is around 200,000 years old. The black one coming into India, 90 to 55,000 years old, and uh, other migrations. So this is what we see. The same story is there in the Y haplogroups, the male haplogroups too. A00 to C are in Africa. F, G, H, I, J, K, L, and R are all in India. And it's from India that the rest of the world has been populated, literally. And you see the same thing over here. We see the F, uh, H, I, J, K, L here and getting out to various parts. So looking at ancient genome, what we can reconstruct by looking at uh, uh, the differences in genome, this is the story that has been pieced together that from Africa to India to else the rest of the world, this is what we are uh, seeing over here. Going forward, if you take a look at this nice animation made by Stephen Oppenheimer, it talks about the uh, empty DNA migrations. He's showing about 85 to 75,000 years ago, this group of people left Africa and they went to the triangular part of India, all the way to Sumatra and uh, Thailand, other places. I want to make a point that by looking at the Narmada man, by looking at Athiram Patam, we know there was one more species of humans living in India. And we uh, refer to them as archaic humans before this migration si signal has come from Africa. So there could be some kind of mixing, but we are not finding the ancient. Uh, 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 indicators over here yet in the genetic studies. But we know the substrate of an very, very ancient uh, genetics in India even prior to that. And going forward, we are seeing that around 75,000 years ago, a super volcano in Sumatra that caused about uh, five meters deep ash covering India and Pakistan. That led to an instant nuclear winter, 1,000 year ice age, and the population crashed to less than 10,000 breeding adults. So even today in Jwalapuram, we are finding evidence of that ash layer. Ravi Kori Setter is a professor who has worked over there, and his works are showing some of these things. And uh, uh, the repopulation of India took place, and around 65,000 years to 50,000 years, and the warming of the ice ages, and it led to the extinction of the Neanderthals. When the Neanderthals died, you're seeing that uh, Homo sapiens, this part of India, have uh, moved out and uh, populated these parts. And uh, moving forward in the story, we are seeing that uh, people are migrating out of India, Siberia, into North and South uh, Americas. That too we are seeing. So this story is consistent with what I told earlier. What about today? This is a very busy slide. I don't want to take any reading out of this, but just want to tell you that mathematically today, if you want to see the genetic composition of Indians, People have tried to have a notion of genetic distance. This is called fixation index, FST. And basically, if you take a list of all the mutations carried by Indians, these are the locations in the chromosomes. You have 22 autosomes, one gender chromosome. You identify certain mutations in each of these things. And you try to see at those locations, what are the differences between different populations? So I have looked at various studies. There's one from uh, Uttaranchal, for example, Uttarakhand over here. And this is looking at whether there is uh, the classical caste system. Are we seeing a stratification in the FST index between the so-called Chaturvarna system? Are we seeing that? And the answer is negative. No such things in the numbers reported. From Andhra Pradesh, several people were studied in this particular paper. Again, absolutely no difference whether you go from Brahmins to tribals or back and so on. The differences are so negligible that they're all nearly the same. If you look at southwest coast of India, Karnataka, Kerala, and other places, looking at various people, various uh, mutations, once again, the numbers come out nearly the same. And uh, one more paper in BMC Genetics, by looking at various uh, language groups, geographical groups, so-called caste groups, everywhere the numbers are the same. Wherever I have uh, under, uh, 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 underlined in red, that is where slight differences show up. But these differences are so small compared to the bedrock of various uh, mutations they've studied. Bottom line, there is no 
distinctness or a break in the Indian genome saying these people are Southern Indians, those are Northern Indians, these are Brahmins, those are Kshatriyas and so on. No such thing is apparent if you like, take a look at these various studies by different people, different corners of India. And uh, today there are some people who try to position that uh, Arvane is a language gene, that the Arvane must have come from uh, Central Asia into India, or it's a high resolution uh, components, Arvane, Z93 and other things. And the problem is that if you look at the origins of Arvane and see various researchers and ask where it originated, these are different male haplogroups. We are looking at Arvane over here. Basho 2003 says Arvane is in Central Asia, uh, Kevisid is saying in Southern Asia, Kordyu is saying Central Asia, Sengupta, North India. This way, you have North India, so South Asia, South Asia, North India, Central Asia, South Asia, South Asia. So you're seeing a divided opinion with a majority seeming to think that even Arvane seems to have originated in India. There are other issues with the high resolution Arvane Z93. I've called it out in my earlier talks. I don't want to go there today. In 2018, there was a claim by David Reich, Harvard Medical School, who came out with this paper that uh, declared that um, uh, in around 7000 BCE, Iranian pastoralists, they entered into India, north and south, they settled over here. And you're seeing 3000 BC after that, you are seeing an entry in 2000 BC, 1500. This is a linguistic uh, uh, analysis uh, over here. This is their assumption. But at that time, I said Vedas, Puranas are talking about Anu, Drihyu migrating out of India, Bhagavad Purana, Vishnu Purana, Vayu Purana, Brahmanda Purana, Matsya Purana, Rig Veda, all are talking about migration out of India. I said, where is that signal over here? This paper does not show that. I said, a red flag must go up. If your model does not accommodate a piece of evidence, then a red flag must go up. You must ask, what is wrong? Is the data wrong? Are the methods wrong? Are the inferences wrong? Is the methodology? Or the So many questions can be raised. So I raised this question in my talks. It turned out that uh, in the very next year, there was another paper by David Reich in Science with Narasimhan and others. They retracted their earlier claim that pastoral farmers had come to India. Instead, they, uh, why they did this? By adding 11 ancient samples in cultural proximity with the IVC at Iran. When they put this additional data into their mathematical works, the models would no longer converge to their earlier answers but would converge to a different answer where this cannot be inferred. But they stuck on to their claim that there was a, a Aryan invasion in this time frame to India. And if you look at the same time, there's also a paper in Cell uh, that uh, looked at the Harappa gene by analyzing the genome from Harappa, that sample by Vasan Shinde and others. So in their paper, they identify what they call an Indus Valley civilization client, the small component from Andamanese hunter-gatherer going back to the very ancient uh, split over here. And if you look at the spread of orange, orange is going out into Iranian hunter-gatherer, Iranian herders, all the way in this timeline going down to 2000 BCE timeframe. And you're seeing Anatolian uh, component entering into Iran in this time frame also. So this paper also is showing that it's an out of India. That is what has been inferred by uh, some of the studies that are done over here. So my final uh, portion of my work is to try to talk to you about antiquity that's seen in Indian astronomy itself. Who looked at Indian astronomy to try and decide some of the things over here other than Indians themselves? Well, it was discovered by the uh, West in two waves. One is an early uh, uh, Greek wave. We leave that out in the story. During the colonial period, we have the Cassini in uh, 1691, Lee Gentle, Euler, Bailey, Playfair, Sam Davis. They all studied Indian astronomy. They were completely warped by it, and they wrote uh, very, very uh, exemplary works that praised the antiquity of India and other such things. Then you have William Jones. This controversy started that with linguistic theories, and the controversies and distortions came from there. The controversies were how old is Indian astronomy? Where did it originate? Because they had assumed by linguistics that India is not an old civilization. Aryans had come to India in 1500 BC. If Indian astronomy shows more ancient dates, they have problems. If Indians show advanced astronomy, then the question is, how did they get their knowledge? So they predispose that question to say, what did Indians learn from the Greeks? Or what did Indians learn from the Babylonians? This is the problem. So everybody shown here in red is now uh, bowing to the linguistic theory and attacking Indian astronomy. 
people in white are still refuting these analysis and saying Indian astronomy is very, very ancient. Dates have been seen there. Now, I uh, don't know why this came out. Uh, okay. Uh, so so uh, uh, we, we have people like Whitney, Weber, Max Muller, Thibault, uh, Nujbauer, Pingree in our times who, who are doing some of these works. So going forward, uh, uh, so the Indian uh, model of astronomy is based on uh, uh, nakshatras and Rashi. And we have got 27 of them, 27 nakshatras. Sky is divided into 27 segments of 13 and one third degree each. Indians have identified principal stars in each of these segments, referring to them by the names of the wives of the moon and for mnemonic purposes. And these were the nakshatras that you see over here. And there was a concept of a lunar month. If the full moon appears in the Chitra nakshatra, that month is called Chaitra Masa. You could use the Amanta full moon or the Purni Amanta, which could be the new moon. You could use either of uh, these things, new moon of, sorry, new moon or full moon to do this. You also had a division of the, uh, of the sky in uh, 30 degree segments to track the movement of the sun. So this is a familiar Rashi model. That's why we say India has got a loony solar calendar. And if you look at the names of the nakshatra in Vedanga Jyotisha Surya Siddhanta, we are seeing that two of our ancient texts have the same names going for a very long period of time. Identification by the British on which those stars are, Kritika, Eta Tauri, Rohini, Alpha Tauri, and so on. And if you look at the names in India of the nakshatras, Sanskrit, Telugu, Kannada, Hindi, Gujarati, Marathi show similar names. There are some variations in Tamil and Malayalam. For example, uh, Ardhra nakshatra is Thiruvadirai over here. And you have Ashlesha as Ilium in Tamil and so on. So this variation is showing to us how ancient this model is. If something is so great and ancient that has had time to start changing into regional variations, it is an indicator of the antiquity of this model. And that is what we are seeing in the uh, different names of the nakshatra. But the common astronomical model is there throughout India. Before we go any further, I'd like to talk to you about Milankovitch cycle. So Milankovitch cycles are described several motions of the uh, Earth is doing. So we have something, uh, uh, goodness, you know what is going on over here? So we have um, the animation has stopped, but through the animation, I'd hope to show you what is happening. There's an orbital cycle where the sun, the earth goes from circular to elliptical orbit in 100,000 years. There's an axial position where the earth is wobbling about the axis in about 26,000 years. And there's an obliquity change in the tilt in 41,000 years. So astronomy observations preserved in ancient Indian texts can be dated using this precision phenomenon. Indians had this notion of four cardinal points of astronomy, the solstice, summer and winter solstice, and the equinox positions. Indians observed what was the nakshatra at a cardinal point, and that is preserved in our text. Now, the nakshatras at a cardinal point will keep changing because of this 26,000-year cycle of uh, uh, precision. Because of that, we can very accurately go back in time and date when these observations might have been done. So ah, this is working now, once again. As you can see, this is the axial precision. You can see uh, in 26,000 years, it traces this deep circle in the sky of this nature. And uh, this is the one primarily that we'll use to uh, the date in the astronomy. First question, the antiquity of Vedanga Jyotisha. The Vedanga Jyotisha has got the Rig Vedic, uh, Vedanga Jyotisha, as well as the Yajurveda component. Several people worked on this. Eventually, uh, I think um, uh, Dikshit came closest to it at 1400 BCE. And if you look at this Abhyankar's work, this is the relevant passage. From this passage, this Bulletin of Astronomical Society of India, 1998, he's talking about how winter solstice occurred when the sun and moon came together in the Dhanishta nakshatra. And the question is, where is this Dhanishta nakshatra? You can simulate this in a planetarium software, and it turns out that you must crank it back in time to 1440 BCE. That is when you see the longitude here is Dhanishta over here, and the sun is at minus 23.3, uh, actually minus 24 uh, degrees south. That is where it is in that period of time. You can count from 90 here, 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. Zero is a celestial equator. Then minus 10, minus 20, minus 24. Sun is at this point. So winter solstice in Dhanishta happened in 1440 BC. It's mentioned in the uh, uh, Vedanga Jyotisha. That's how we did that. Shatapata Brahmana, Yagnya Valkya. This is the uh, Egling translation of that one. And you can see that it refers repeatedly saying that 
The Kritikas do not move from the eastern quarter, and therefore the Vedic practitioner can set up his yajna or the fires under the Kritika nakshatra. So this particular passage was interpreted by Tilak and uh, uh, several others, and they try to show it's an archaeoastronomical observation, and they said it refers to the heliacal rising of Kritika. Where is the true east direction? The true east direction is in the date of the equinox. At that date, you see the sun appears exactly on the eastern direction. At every other point, the sun is going to the north to plus 23.3 or to the south to minus 23.3. So on the day of the equinox, it is on the celestial equator. So when was Kritika last on the celestial equator? With a heliacal rising, meaning that Kritika rises first and then later on the sun also rises over the horizon, over there. It turns out to be 2982 BCE, April 15th for the date of the equinox over here. Very, very amazing ancient date preserved over here. If you look at several Indian works, preserve an ancient epoch. Puranas talk about Kali Yuga. Aryabhata, Siri Siddhanta refer to that. Pulasi Siddhanta, Brahmagupta, Alberini refer to that. Aihole Temple Archaea Epigraphy, that refers to it. Now, Cassini studied some science tables brought by other French researchers over there. And he said the astronomical tables coming from Thailand seem to have that meridian described with respect to Benares. And they have an absolute date of 3102 BC, February 17th, 18th, encoded in it. Later on, Playfair, Bentley, Colebrook, Burgess, they studied the same phenomenon in Suri Siddhanta, and they came to the same conclusion. It turns out to be a rare conjunction of planets, sun, moon, and Revati nakshatra. This is a marker that we traditionally identify as Kali Yuga. I simulated that in the planetarium software, and you can see that with Surya over here, Chandran, Guru, Shukran over here, Revati Nakshatras over here, Mangala, Mars, Budhan, Mercury, Shani, Saturn, all clustered in this particular place, 3102 BC. This is a phenomenon that is not repeated, to my knowledge, at least for 26,000 years, if not more. We have not had this uh, cyclical thing come back over here. We have got references in Rig Veda to Aditi. Aditi and Diti, co-sister Diti, through Kashyapa, gave rise to the Adityas, the Rudras, Vasus, Devas, Daityas. One is a Patra Uttrayana, Dakshinayana, and so on. And uh, uh, she's associated with the uh, Nakshatra Punarvashu, which means renewal, return, restoration, repetition. Why is that so? Well, let's take a look at uh, Aitriya Brahmana. This is the Martin Hogg translation. In the second chapter, we are seeing a very, very cryptic statement over here. The sacrifice, Yajna, had gone away from the gods. Gods were unable to perform any further ceremony. They did not know where it had gone to. They said to Aditi, let us know the sacrifice through thee. Aditi said, Tatastu, let it be so. But I will choose a bone from you. They said, choose. Then she chose his bone. All sacrifices will begin and end with me. What does this mean? What does this mean? Indians always observed any yajna or any festival or any occurrence with respect to the celestial calendar. Celestial calendar marked vernal equinox happening in certain places. That is the beginning of the new year. What nakshatra is there? That's what told them that. They found because of precision that nakshatra no longer was in the vernal equinox position and they did not know where the sacrifice had gone. They did not know how to perform the sacrifice. So here is an indication that the calendar was reset to Aditi because of the effect of precision. Normally, these effects can be seen over thousands of years. So you can see how ancient the Indian calendar was. And by the time this particular uh, verse was orally recited, Aitreya Brahmana, you're seeing that things had changed. The calendar was reset to Aditi. Aditi said, the new year will begin and end with me at Vernal Equinox. That is what Aditi is saying here. And uh, Tilak had called this out, also Abhyankar. If you want to date this, you will see when did Vernal Equinox happen in the Punar Vashana Chitra. Punarvashu Nakshatra today is where the stars Diti and Arind, uh, uh, sorry, Aditi are. These stars are known in Greek as Castor and Pollux. So we look at the sky and ask when did vernal equinox happen over here? We are seeing that the date has got to be cranked back to 6000 BCE. So I don't know how to explain this, but Aitri Brahmana has got clearly the statement saying that Aditi is saying, sacrifice will begin and end with me. That is coming to this particular date over here. In Suri Siddhanta, we are seeing a great conjunction, the Mesha Rashi. And this can be dated to uh, uh, February 22nd, 6779 BCE. Suri Siddhanta is a compendium of works added on over great periods of time. We are seeing enormous trigonometry, spherical geometry, and mathematical works, astronomical works, as well as very ancient encodings also. This is one of the very ancient encodings of Suri Siddhanta. In 6779 BC, we are seeing a 
clustering of the planets here. Now, the question is, did Indians backdate these things? Did they have the technology? Did they have the precision in their models to backdate and say, this is where the planet should have been? No, it's not possible. The errors would grow backwards very, very rapidly. So this is clearly an eyewitness observation encoded culturally in the memory in Suri Siddhanta. That's what they see. Ashwinis are spoken about in various ways, the Greek way, the Puranas and others. And we all know the story about uh, uh, Surya, Sanjana, and uh, uh, Chaya, and the Ashwinis. So the story says that uh, Sanjana, who was Surya's wife, she couldn't take the heat of the sun. So she abandons her husband and flees to the cooler regions, southern regions, basically over here, and leaves Chaya in her place. Surya discovers the deception, forces her to say where she is. Chaya says that Sanjana has gone to southern region. She is hiding in the form of a mare. So Surya also takes the form of a mare, goes to southern region, and the Ashwini twins are born over there. This is what the story says. So clearly, the fact that Surya has gone to southern region means in northern hemisphere, it is winter solstice. And uh, when Ashwini's new stars are coming over there, it is heliacal rising of Ashwini, the heliacal rising of Ashwini over here. And this was called out again by uh, uh, Tilak, as well as others. And let me move forward. So this says uh, heliacal rising of Ashwini nakshatras over here, heliacal rising, this is the horizon over here. This date comes to 7,200 BCE, or approximately 9,000 years old. If you will refer to an article I wrote in Medium, in medium.com, Raj Vidin, to search for my article, I've shown an amazing instance. Recently, a paper came out, just about three months back, a paper came out talking about a violent solar event that happened 9,000 years ago. That violent solar event caused such a big flare. Today, if flares happen with regularity, we have some radio communication disruptions and so on. But the magnitude of this event was thousands of times bigger than anything Earth has ever experienced. And the remnants of that are in the ice uh, core records in Antarctica, in uh, Greenland and other places. They analyzed that and showed that that event happened around 9,000 years ago. I correlated that event that it could be this cultural memory that Indians have in the story of Ashwini, how sun was so bright that Chaya had, to, sorry, Sanjana had to abandon her husband. And uh, Sanjana's father, Vishwakarma, he lessened the brightness of the sun later, and she they had domestic bliss after that. So this actually is a phenomenon that's recorded in this particular scientific paper. So please do take a look at that, Raj, uh, medium.com. Search for my name, you'll find the paper. One more ancient observation of Swati is there in Suri Siddhanta, which is called out by Anil Narayanan in this particular book. It turns out that all the stars in our solar, in our uh, neighborhood of the solar system, are jointly going around the Milky Way galaxy, and we take around 230 million years to complete one go around this. But some stars are going faster than the others. So Swati is a star in Greek called Arcturus. This is a Saptarishi, it points to Swati over here. It is one of the fastest stars in what we call proper motion. From our perspective, we can't recognize the three-dimensional motion of a star. It has got radial velocity, space, and transverse velocity. But we can measure the angle. How quickly does the angle change respect to a fixed reference? So with respect to the sun, how quickly is this angle changing? That is a proper motion angle. Swati is the fastest one. It has got two arc seconds a year. Swati is recorded as Arcturus in the Greek records, and the Greek position is off by one degree compared with today. So we can drill backwards 1,800 years. However, Suri Siddhanta is off by six degrees. So if we try to take six degrees, multiply 60 minutes, 60 seconds, divided by two arc seconds, we get approximately 8,000 BCE is when that particular observation of Swati was made in, uh, in the Suri Siddhanta. Staggering amounts of time. In an earlier period, I talked about these dates. People will laugh and say, wait a minute, Indian civilization or the Indian people are not that old. They were primitive, backward, uh, Neolithic or uh, Paleolithic people. They could not have done all these things. But we are seeing archaeology, radiometric dating, the showed in Saraswati going back 9,000 years, 8,000 years. We are seeing in archaeogenetics, we are seeing great antiquity. And now collaboration is coming from archaeoastronomy in addition that we have got several ancient dates encoded here. So we can see many instances of interest can be dated with these observations. Date of Kali Yuga, for example, revealing a Vedic concept in place much earlier than the alleged Aryan invasions. The dates preserved in Vedas, Brahmanas, Upanishads are showing great antiquity. We ask the question, how can Vedic concepts be in place in India prior to the so-called Aryan invasion of 1500 BC? 
red flag, huge red flag over here, saying there's some problem with the model. So you can rebut some of Max Muller's works. Using linguistic analysis, he proposed the Chandas period, Mantra, Brahmana, Sutra period. He stuffed all the early books of Rig Veda, Chandas period, 1200 to 1000 BC, Mantra period, remaining books of Rig Veda, Brahmana period, and 800 to 600 BC, Sutra period, when Vedanga Jyotisha also was composed, 600 to 200 BC. But we have seen that Kohlbrook himself has pointed out Vedanga Jyotisha's 1400 BC. Where is that and where is 200 BC? We saw Kritika and Chatapata Brahmana 2982 BC, but according to Max Miller, it is 800 to 600 BC Brahmana period. In Rig Veda, Aditi, and Ashwini, we saw 6,000, 7,200 BC, but according to Max Miller, it is 1,200 uh, BC. So clearly, we have a problem over here. So astronomy is showing something else. And what was Max Miller's response? Max Miller was challenged, asking, should all of Indian chronology be held hostage to the biblical chronology? He was so upset, he wrote this book on ancient Hindu astronomy and chronology, in which he only accepted Colebrook's date because that is after his Aryan invasion, 1400 BC, but he discarded all the other works as unreliable. He said, I'm not going to accept any of the Indian works. These are all unreliable. Such views are the received wisdom for many Indian scholars too. I have had the unfortunate experience of talking to some who, uh, uh, when I query them about Indian astronomy, they have standard lines saying that Indian astronomy is unreliable and so on. But when I probe their understanding or knowledge of Indian astronomy, I see it as zero. They know nothing. They know nothing about Indian astronomy, but they have the received wisdom that is encoded in their heads. So clearly we have problems over there. This is what today we call confirmation bias. So Max Muller, we have seen, he believed the 4004 creation date. He believed 1500 BC Aryans. That was his belief. The evidence presented to him from astronomy was that it is much, much beyond that. What did he accept? He only accepted the 15, the 1400 BC for Vedanga Jyotisha because it is within his belief system, and he rejected everything else as unreliable. This is what we clearly identify as confirmation bias today, and that is what he's guilty of. It's an evidence of failed methodology in colonial scholarship, and by extension, today's academia too, that seems to hold on to some of these notions. So the received wisdom versus facts, I'm at the end of my talk here. People who assert uh, uh, AIT, EMT, they say linguistics implies common ancestral language, homeland for the ancestral language, dispersal by invasion and migration. However, those claims do not follow from the methodology, from the data followed. And people who reject that say ABC do not prove Central Asian homeland, invasion, migration to India. Talagir issues that you can use the same thing and show an out of India migration. Archaeology in Indus Valley, Harappa, show evidence of destruction. Experts have aided. I've shown Dale's work, uh, uh, Kenneth Kennedy and others. There is no destruction, no fires, no mass killings. Then they claim genetics shows RNA Z93 from Central Asia implying migration. Many scholars have studied this. There is no consensus. I have discussed the problems in these studies in my earlier talks. Please do look at that. I've shown that you cannot. Those claims do not follow from the methodology that you have adopted. They say Indians and Dravidians are racist in India. The racial theory is bogus. I've shown the FST over here, going back to a very ancient period of time, there's no difference. There's no difference. Either this mixing has been very recent, 4,000 years or so, Indians are thoroughly mixed. There is no question of uh, uh, racial construct in Indians. There is no such thing. So it's a bogus theory. There are two language families in India, according to them, Indo-Aryan and Dravidian. However, the evidence from uh, prominent linguists today shows India as a language spratbunt. It's a linguistic area. Ancient coexistence of languages leading to mixing and divergences. That is a model that is not uh, proposed in this invasion model of linguistic uh, uh, analysis. They claim that River Saraswati is mythical, but we see satellite imagery, several geological studies and others have shown that definitely was a river, which dried up in 1900 BC, 400 years before the alleged AIT EMT. Astronomy is unreliable as per Max Muller. But unfortunately for him, we can validate many of these dates to very ancient time frames, and we can collaborate this along with geology, along with archaeology, along with genetics. All this can be uh, collaborated. Concluding remarks, I put a big crossover here. There is no Aryan invasion theory. I started with question marks. We can assert that there is an out of India. They say that the Aryans, Dravidians, tribals are wrong. These identities are manufactured. They say Indian civilization is recent. We can claim that it is ancient. I have not addressed these topics in purple over here, the subject of another two-hour lecture, literally. 
that uh, how Indian thought impacted the East and the West and such things. Concluding remarks, Indian deep history. What is deep history? I would like to use the term deep history instead of prehistory. Prehistory does a disservice to Indians. Deep uh, prehistory supposes that only when you see evidence of writing, then that is history. Anything prior to that is prehistory. That does a great disservice to the oral tradition of India. Indians for the longest time had a reliable and completely error-free uh, oral tradition, as we can demonstrate and prove. Why would we put down our own civilization by using the word prehistory? I would like to not even call it proto-history, but deep history. The oral tradition preserves a deep history. So I, I uh, uh, request people to start using the term deep history. Thought in schools and universities is utterly wrong. Five agencies have enforced their ideologies and frameworks, controlling the historiography, even today, colonial, Eurocentric, missionary, socialist, academic, and the Marxists. They're holding it tightly to the chest. That's why even today we are not able to change the narrative, but we should continue this. Linguistic methodology is upheld by them to prop up their narratives. It does not align with evidence from many other fields. Therefore, we can say it is falsified. The claims from them are falsified. The antiquity of human presence seen, uh, is seen in archaeology. Antiquity is seen in genetics migration. Antiquity of humans is seen in astro uh, sorry, Indians are seen in astronomy. It is supported by material evidence from archaeology. There is strong evidence to uphold the antiquity of the Indian civilization. Evidence-based narration clearly is discrediting the opinion-based, received wisdom-based Aryan invasion of migration theory. Using these theories constrains the Indian chronology to 1500 BC. If you demolish these things, suddenly those chains that have been put on us can be shackled, those shackles can be destroyed. And you can see Indian chronology can be pushed up significantly to ancient time frames. So with that, I come to the end of my talk. So uh, please do see my talks on YouTube by searching for my name, Raj Vedan, or you can see my works on uh, uh, Facebook or Twitter. You can follow me over there on Coact. Thank you, sir. I think uh, I can only say that we are highly and highly indebted to you. And uh, for myself, I can say that uh, I am mesmerized by the depth of this research and uh, rigorous methodology followed to test the hypothesis and arrive at a conclusion. I, sometimes uh, when I was listening to this lecture and the highly scientific uh, tools that you have used, I, I was thinking that I wish I would not have listened to this lecture because uh, ignorance, I was living in ignorance is bliss. <laughs> and now you have shaken us all up that uh, how, how less we know about ourselves. That's the most important thing like if we know the distorted view of history that have been taught to us and i live in jnu and we know that in jnu one of the most important things that i learned from this this uh your your today's presentation is this departments are so separate we social sciences we learn social sciences through some social science theories and we never use these scientific tools and by using these scientific tools you you you, you have shown to us clearly that how well we can learn ourselves and history. So in one line, if I have to say, I can say that you have pushed all of us to move from the opinion-based history to evidence-based history. 